Hey everybody, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel. Sorry it's been a little while. I have been quite busy lately, especially with the holidays coming up. Um, but with that being said, uh, today's talk is actually inspired by one of my current students, Taka from Japan. And he sent me, he was watching one of the lessons and it inspired a video uh, that he had remembered watching at a certain point and he sent it to me just today. Uh, and the video is called An Introduction to HDR Photography. The talk that I want to have with you today was inspired by something that he spoke about, just something he mentioned through this video. Now, it's a worthwhile video to watch for any artist or photographer, for that matter. But um, this particular subject was sparked by one of the things he said, and he was talking about how to make interesting photographs. All right. And what he said immediately made me reflect on what it is that I focus on today as an artist after doing it for 15, 20 years and how my focus today has changed in the last five, 10 years where I was focused. I might've been focused on slightly different things and the more, the, the, the more I evolve, the more I grow and improve as an artist, the more I start to lean towards this particular type of focus. It's something that took me a while to learn because I had to get over certain personal prejudices and beliefs that I had in my own mind for whatever reason, however they got there, I don't know, but that many artists have and have to take a second look at. And that's what I want to do with you today. I want you to take a second look at the type of artwork that you produce so that you can get a better grasp of what it is that you produce and furthermore, how to have a stronger impact and a more memorable impact with your audience. All right. If you hear kids screaming their heads off outside, my, my, the kids next door are loud as hell, especially when they play hockey, street hockey. Hey, Canada. All right. So with that being said, in this video that I was watching, the introduction to HDR photography video, he talks about making interesting photographs. The rule number one, he says, to making interesting photography is put yourself in front of interesting things, which is a bit of an ironic answer, right? It's a bit sarcastic almost, but it's extremely true. Now, what does that mean? Before I get into the details of this, what does this mean for you as a painter, as an artist, as a concept artist, illustrator, sketch artist, animator, whatever the case might be? There's two sides to who you are. Not everything you are is an artist. You're also a human. You're also a person. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if we stereotype an artist, they're a type of person who always has paint on them. They all have long hair and some like hipster beard or whatever the case might be, right? Um, and they all smell like patchouli oil and they smoke beaties and eat nothing but pate from Venice and spend every night for entertainment. They go and watch the opera. Okay, that's it. That's that's what we are. That's 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 our whole life. This is what we do. And if we're not doing that, we're sitting in a studio drawing beautiful naked women and then making love to them after or beautiful naked men or whatever the case might be. All right. This is what we do. This is our lifestyle, which, of course, is not the case, because as artists, we have our times where we're artistic, where we're observing the world around us, where we're getting fascinated with things. We're learning. We're we're studying. We're growing. We're improving. We're caught in our creative bubble and we're appreciating other other great arts or we're spending time in galleries and there's other times where we like to sit down and play video games and watch tv maybe you like to watch soap operas maybe you like to go out and play a game of soccer you know you like you you might not have an exotic taste for food maybe chicken and rice is what you're about you know there's two different sides to who we are right there's the human the regular everyday human and then there's the artist and although they very often mix they're two different they're two different facets of our personality what we more often tend to gravitate towards and give our focus to when we're growing artistically is naturally our artistic self right our creative self our expressive self our technical self all of these different things and we tend to separate our regular everyday life and throw it into the back burner i'll worry about that when i'm done being an artist and what i'm telling you is combine them the reason why is because your audience, 99% of your audience out there are not other artists. They're your friends, they're accountants, they work in PR, they work in advertising, they work in, in law. Everybody's got a different job, different passions, different ways of life. And that's the majority of your audience. And that's also a part of a big part of who you are as well. But in our heads as artists, and I know I've had this and many of the artists that I speak to have this prejudice about 
common everyday things. Or at least we think that that's something that, or at least a prejudice when it comes to our, our artwork and that, the type of stuff we don't want to integrate into our artwork. We generally tend to call them cliche, corny, common, unoriginal, boring. When in fact, the only thing that makes these common everyday occurrences, these common everyday things, boring, cliche, whatever the case might be, is in how you interpret them artistically. A perfect example is something, the last painting I did, if you haven't checked it out, it's the vampire, right? Uh, the, the, this one right here, okay? If you, I went back five, six years ago, I probably wouldn't, even, wouldn't have even thought of painting a vampire. Okay, why? Because vampires are cliche. It would have to be some kind of an exotic kind of hybrid creature, something you've never heard of before, blah, blah, blah. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, I just watched Hotel Transylvania. You know, some cliche blah, blah, blah. You know, that's what I just popped in my head. Whatever, I digress. But vampire in and of itself is cliche if I give her the, you know, if I give them the fangs and the dark eye makeup and make her go, <sighs> okay, that's cliche, but that's not what I'm doing. I wanted to, the way I portrayed it was the viciousness of a woman. I wanted to show betrayal and pain and anger in her face, revenge, okay? Those were the things that I was painting. But I was painting a vampire with sharp teeth. It was in doing that, that, that my audience, my friends, all of my friends on social media, whatever the case might be, gravitated towards it. It was a subject that everybody could relate to on a personal level. Everybody knows vampires. But they appreciated my original take on it. An original take on it in a way that was digestible. You know, I wasn't doing a vampire knitting, something that was so completely abstract that people didn't know what the hell I was painting. There was a sense of familiarity in what I was doing, right? But my, interp my artistic interpretation of it, her emotional self, that which I was painting, the subject that I was actually painting, uh, made her something that was familiar and appealing, yet original. A lot of artists think of the word vampire, think of the word zombie, think of the word werewolf, think of the word whatever as typical cliche Halloween things that they avoid. And what I'm saying is you don't have to be completely abstract to be brilliant, to be original. You don't have to be any of those things. You can touch on subjects that are very common in everyday life that everybody, artist or not artist, can relate to and still produce something that's brilliant and different. Think of a lot of classical paintings, what people painted. Well, people painted things that were common in their everyday life. Kings and maidens and falling in love and gardens and beautiful landscapes. Type of stuff that everybody saw. Type of stuff we see today. Nothing new. And it was representative of the time. So their fashion and the composition and the location was all reflective of what was going on around them. But it was in, in the way that they rendered it, in the colors that they chose, in the values that they chose, in the way they captured their emotions, the way they used a composition to keep your eye constantly moving within the image and never letting it get, leave the image. Like a lot of Rembrandt's work, for instance, something he talks about in this video as well, is what made them geniuses and what made them respected. But they're not painting anything completely and utterly original because there had to be something that their audience could connect with to make them more desirable, more employable, so on and so forth. So that's the thing, that's the, the stigma, that's the, 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 the prejudice that I want you to start revisiting. And if being cliche is something that you actually want to exploit and be and exaggerate, then so be it. Because maybe you're more of a comic painter. Maybe you're somebody who likes to really shove cliche right up in people's face. Maybe you're somebody who likes to expose the superficiality of, you know, of uh, the fact that girls, whenever they take selfies, always show the same side of their face. <laughs> I have friends that I tease all the time. I swear to God, you can flip through every single picture on their phone. Not that I do that because that's kind of stalking you. That's a bit stocky, right? But if you go through every single one of their Facebook pictures, all of them, every single one of them, it's always the same corner angle of the face and you know who you are if you're watching my video right? <laughs> That's maybe something you want to catch on and exploit, you know, like do a painting of like, you know, 45 women all standing there in front of a phone like this, all showing their good side, right? The Mariah Carey thing. So when it comes to the technical sides of art, now that we've kept, 
be it a cliche or a not cliche subject, what is it that makes our artwork interesting and how can we put ourselves in the right type of headspace and expose ourselves to the right types of things so that our, we're receptive to interesting stuff so that we can get that kind of impact, we can produce that kind of an impact with our artwork. Well, as he says in the video, the number one thing to creating interesting art is to put yourself in front of, in front of things that are interesting often, okay? And that's very, very true. When you start to realize the importance of creating artwork that actually has an interesting subject, something that we enjoy as people, you start to realize that spending more time researching that type of stuff before you start a painting becomes more and more important because that's the kind of stuff that's going to grab your audience and entertain them the most. It's the fact that they actually find it cool and interesting, right? If you're doing something entirely for yourself all the time without taking your audience into account, if they don't give, if they don't pay you any attention to your work, well, you asked for it, right? If you don't care if they give your artwork any attention, if you don't care if they, it matters to them, well, fine, then, then paint whatever the hell you want. But otherwise, it's important to research these things. What do people find funny? What do people find scary? What do people find fascinating? What do people find insightful? What do people find mysterious? Depending on the type of artwork that you like to produce and put thought into that, research it, watch things online. And when you find something interesting, maybe you're comp maybe like my student Brandon, who's completely and utterly obsessed with Indiana Jones. Not that I blame him. It is the best movie series of all time. But what is it about Indiana Jones that, that, that Brandon's so completely fascinated with? Well, there's a lot of things he might be fascinated with, right? The, the use of composition, the use of light, the use of char the, the character, Harrison Ford's character. You know, the, 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 whole, uh, the whole way Nazis are portrayed, the, the, all of these different things. Kind of always taking a very, still, Spielberg is very nostalgic. And he's very good at capturing different eras, the 40s and 50s and 60s and that kind of stuff, right? That kind of idea. Maybe that's what it is that interests you. Okay, well, how did he do that? What is Start to get into the psychological side of, of what these different producers, artists, whatever the case might be, get into the production side of what they do and ask yourself these fundamental questions. How did they make me feel this way? What is it about that film? You know, like I watch Indiana Jones and I feel just deep textured connection. I really feel this immersiveness, this authenticity in, in his art in his in his filmmaking even though blah 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 and then i watched the movie the movie the mummy which is very closely related it has a bit more of a comic twist it's a little bit more of a gun gun shoot shoot type of thing it makes me feel this way this one what makes this feel more authentic than this one what is this how come this makes me feel more like i'm watching an authentic you know, an authentic scene in Egypt. And this one, which is supposed to take place in Egypt, feels less. It feels more like a movie set. What's the difference in the way these two people these two people produce their film that gives me that slightly different experience? That kind of idea. If you're looking at a film like Paranormal Activity versus Friday the 13th, they're both horror movies. Yet this one literally makes me want to shit my pants. And this one, I, I actually kind of laugh and find kind of entertaining. Why? What's the difference? How do they use colors differently? How's composition differently? How's the how is the character presented in the frame differently? What's the music like? What are all these different things that are making me have this different experience? Ask yourself, what kind of artists, what kind of experience do you want to share with your audience? And start aiming towards that. Your audience is going to have that same type of connection to these types of films as you do, right? Because that's the human side of you. That's not the the artist is is the the artist has the ability to take it apart, deconstruct it, and use that knowledge to produce their own particular brand of artwork. But the human in you is just enjoying the film just like everybody else does. While you're sitting there enjoying the film, you're just enjoying it. The next is how to use the tools, the artistic technical technical tools that you have at your disposal to get that message through to your audience. And what I want to do is very quickly share with you one way, not the be all end all way, but one way you can look at these different facets, these technical facets of artwork as a little bit of maybe a bit of a checklist, not that I like to checklist art that much, but as a bit of a checklist so that you can make sure to nail all of these different 
facets of art in your own art production so that you can use everything at your disposal to get that impact and get that message through to your audience. And the first thing is story. I've mentioned this a thousand times, narrative. Well, what is narrative? What is visual storytelling? Well, visual storytelling is in essence the emotion of your piece of artwork. By just doing generic artwork, by just, you know, doing a dwarf. There's a dwarf, he's got an axe, good for him. Dwarf and axe equals character design. It's not an illustration. Your audience isn't gonna feel anything looking at this character. They're just gonna go, oh cool, look character, right? It's a design, it's, it's production, it's got production value. That's gonna be modeled, okay? But if you wanna create a piece of artwork, an illustration or a piece of concept art that makes your audience go, whoa, and feel something, then you need to have some kind of a narrative. Think about it. When you're watching, if you've ever watched The Hobbit, which if you haven't, you're an idiot, and I know a lot of people are like, The Hobbit wasn't as good as Lord of the Rings. You know what? Well, we'll screw you if you feel that way. You're an idiot. <laughs> My video, I can say I can say anything I want, but I digress. Um, I'm kidding, no. <laughs> you're, you're, you're welcome to have any opinion you want. But um, in The Hobbit, every single one of those hobbits has a unique identity, their own backstory. They all have their own unique recipe and blend and then what's his face that i can't i can never remember his name the scottish guy who comes to spoiler alert the scottish guy who comes in in the battle of the five armies on his boar you know the scotsman you know he shows up and he shows up to face off with the elves and stuff like that he's got his own backstory he comes from a different type of he's a dwarf from a different type of land and he's got a different type of mentality and he's known for being completely out of his freaking skull and he fights with his head you know, he hits plate armor with his with his head because his head's basically cast iron, right? That kind of thing. He's got his own backstory. So story is the emotion. It's the it's your it's your audience's ability. You use narrative to get your audience to give a shit about what it is that you're actually drawing or painting. To actually not just give a shit in terms of them being able to say, ooh, nice piece of artwork, it's them giving a shit in the way of saying, wow, this actually matters to me on a personal level. I wanna tell my friends about it. The next thing is value, actual values, light, dark. Value has several important elements in it that connect with your audience. On a very direct level, artist or not, people are going to respond to this whether there are artists or not. Value is clarity, impact. And lastly, value is intensity. If your values are muddled and a little off grays and they're a little bit flat, your image is going to be flat. It's going to be dull to the senses. If you want to create something that's visually striking, that grabs people, that makes that feels like it's jumping off the page, then you want to have a full range of value. Your highs, your mediums, and your lows. And you want to use that in a way that makes the story jump out in a person's face so that people can so that you're controlling your audience's attention. You're grabbing them and pulling them where you need to, and then you're pulling them around the canvas wherever you need them to go as well, keeping them immersed in your image. Without clear sense of values, you are create, you are, your story will not be clear. If I'm telling you a story, the right way to tell you a story, if I was talking about somebody walking down the street and buying a magazine would be, I had a couple of dollars, so I went down the street, I walked into the store, I grabbed the magazine I wanted to buy off the counter, put it on the counter, paid for the magazine, went home, sat down, made a coffee, and read it. That was a very clear story, and every step of that story was very clearly described. From beginning to end, you will remember it, right? But if I'm telling you a story and I go, uh, oh, well, I wanted to buy a magazine because my friend Bobby uh, likes magazines. He's, Bobby's my friend, the guy who, who works at the music shop down the street in Halifax. Not, not the Halifax in Canada, but there's a, actually a Halifax in Africa, if you didn't realize that. He, well, not that he lives in Africa. Africa is a wonderful, city, wonderful country, by the way. You know, like there's a lot of different interesting places you can visit. But I personally prefer Australia. I had a couple of Australian friends. See what I'm talking about? Like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Well, you can make the same thing mistake with your values. If you have values hopping around all over your image and they're not clear and segmented, if they're not organized in a proper fashion, then your values are going, then you're, you're going to lose the clarity of your image. So it's very important to keep them very well organized. That's clarity of values. Impact is how well you use your contrasts and how controlled your contrasts. 
And last but not least, intensity is how hard you push those extremes in your values. So that's how you use value to tell a story. The next is color. And color is soul. There are many artists out there, God love them, absolutely amazing, inspiring artists out there that are very, very inspiring and incredible value painters. I mean, they inspire everybody and they're well known in the industry because they bloody well deserve it. They're extremely talented. But color is soul. And without color, what you're creating is visual design, which if that's your focus, then fantastic. But if you really want to create something that really connects with your audience on an emotional level, that's color. Value alone is going to tell the story, but color is going to, is going to really have the most important, play the most important role in terms of getting people to feel a certain way about what you're painting and the story that you're painting. Narrative and color work hand in hand in that regard. Value is going to help all of this become very, be very readable. And furthermore, it's going to throw that story in people's face, faces. The last most important thing, and this is something I've kind of described in different ways in other videos, but I want to keep bring you back to this again. And that is your picture has to please you, but honestly please you. You have to learn the art of stepping away and taking a third person perspective at your own work. When I'm working on a painting, I always step away and I come back an hour or two or maybe the next day and I look at it as I look at it as if it was somebody sending me their artwork and saying, Adam, what do you think of this? And I look at it from a very critical perspective and I go, it's good, it's good, but you know, I could definitely do this and change that and change this. I'm not quite enjoying this piece enough. I feel like I can do better than this. And I come back to my own work and I keep painting it until I get the joy from it that I wanted to. Because until I feel joy, nobody else will. And you have to be honest with that. You have to answer that question honestly in yourself. You have to be able to look at your stuff from a third person perspective, not bash it, not look at it and go, oh God, this is shit. That's not what I mean. That's just self abuse. I'm, I'm talking about being able to look at your artwork and say, okay, this doesn't look the way I want it to look. What do I need to do to improve it? And improve it and prove exactly what it is. Do you ever notice this? Do you ever notice it's easier to critique and help other people improve their work? But when it comes to analyzing your own stuff, you get so confused. There's two reasons for that. One is because as artists, we're very often pushing ourselves to our limit, right? We're always flirting with the limit of our capacity all the time. And sometimes we just have this breakthrough and boom, we fly. And other days we really struggle with that plateau and we're sitting there and what would normally take us a couple of hours to really nail quickly, it takes us days and we're, oh God, this is what a struggle I'm having with this, okay? That struggle is very often our own ego preventing us from, from accepting the fact that what we've painted isn't, a, isn't the best thing we've ever done. And as soon as we can step away, pull our ego out of the equation and look at it and go, am I happy when I look at this painting or do I feel a little bit unsatisfied with it? Unsatisfied? Okay, what do I need to do to fix it? and then fix it. Once you get that authentic feeling of joy in your own artwork, then you're more likely to get joy from your illicit joy from your audience confided. You connect with them in a way that is authentic and something that they can relate to as well. So I hope you enjoyed my talk. Remember, if you're interested in the Lucid Pixel mentorship, if you want to sign up now, I have one spot. I actually have one spot that just opened up. So thank you very much for watching, as always. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Take care, everybody.